Can everyone hear me? All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Julian. I'm a user experience librarian. Can you hear me at the back? That's good. Okay. I'm a user experience librarian at the University of Guelph, and we study various aspects of the library. But today, I'm going to be talking to you about a specific study where we looked at first year students' perceptions of learning objects and how they integra integrate them or not into their study practices. So this is just a visual representation of pretty much every UX study that we go through. I'm, I just wanted to provide a little bit of context, um, so I'll go through this really quickly. So first we have the initial meeting with the stakeholder, so the person who commissioned the study. And in this case, um, he wanted us to look at this topic because he was thinking about the future directions of digital strategies for the library. And also it's super related to our library's digital learning commons, which is still in its infancy today. After that, and based on those interactions, the UX team goes away and we design the study. And for this study, we looked at um, first year students and we did group, small group interviews as well as sort of a contextual inquiry into how they navigate their course management system. From that, we then recruited the students. So we had a connection with the course coordinator with the first year chemistry course, also known as the Killer Chem course, which has hundreds and hundreds of students. So she, so we're approaching this more like a case study. So she was able to recruit for the students through the course management system, which was awesome. We had $10 hospitality cards to offer for incentive for students to participate as well. From there, we conducted the study and analyzed the study, as easy as that, <laughs> and I'll just share the results with you. So to reiterate, the primary study questions are, what are students' perceptions of supplemental learning objects, both library supplemental learning objects and objects ex um, external to the library? And how do they integrate them or not into their study practices? So again, we had first year students, second semester in the Killer Chem course, 18 participants total, nine small group interviews, $10 hospitality cards. And this happened, um, the study was conducted in March and April 2017, which coincided, it was a, the perfect time, it coincided with when students were receiving their midterm grades. So their learning strategies and their approaches to the course were really top of mind. So we had them look at four different learning objects and make comments. The first one was a video that we created. You can see there was a libguide, and then we had them look at print and an online handout that, that were exactly the same, all around sort of the same topic here as of midterm marks and multiple choice exams. Okay, so the results. Where do stu students turn for help? This is just a laundry list of sort of the most popular supports where students um, described looking for help. The first five or six you can see to me really highlight the importance of in-person help. So they're looking for creating peer study groups, upper year mentors, or hiring, hiring a tutor. And then the last, um, following that, the four or five are more online help, which they do sort of individually. Um, you can see they looked specifically at two academic sources, so Mastering Chem and Khan Academy were where they turned to. Um, but in general, it surprised me as students weren't really discerning in um, who the source of that help was. They didn't care if it was university branded or affiliated with any university, and specifically, they didn't look to see if it was U of G branded. And then the last two that I have highlighted were probably the most popular. They talked about the importance of practicing problems, so they would search the internet for different chemistry problems to do them and practice over and over. And lastly, friends, and just to highlight how important friends are in, uh, in terms of their learning support network, I have a couple quotes I wanna read to you. So this was one participant. Well, we have dinners together with our other roommate too, so we will just bring up school stuff. We even have study sessions together where we work at the same table and work on stuff and then say, oh, what is this, and then talk about it. Another student said, the first thing that I do if I wasn't sure would be to go to my peers and see what their take on it is. Another person, for me, I just consult with my friends. We heard this over and over again, how important peers are to their learning. First, as a way of reinforcing what they know. So if they're able to explain a concept to their friend, to them, that's a way that they know that they understand it. And as well as you see in these quotes that student peers are their first line of support, so they're really reluctant to go to the professor, they go to their friends first. So that was sort of the first major theme. The second major theme, I'm gonna read a couple quotes again. 
I just feel like for me, no matter how hard I work for it, no matter how hard I work for it, I wouldn't get perfect. And there's always some concept that I guess I'm not fully understanding. But if I don't do well, that means I didn't do enough practices. And this longer one, I never went into office hours, even though I didn't know what I was doing, mainly because I don't want to ask for help. I'm afraid of kind of wasting their time. It's a barrier for me to get better. And also, I think I have too much pride in myself, and I don't think I need anybody else's help. I can figure this out by myself. That's just who I am. I was really impressed with how self-aware these first year, second semester students were. Like, they were so insightful. They knew this, the learning strategies that they um, practiced. They knew how they approached this course. And if the midterm didn't go as planned, they already had developed a plan of attack, how to adapt and change those strategies. It was really impressive. And also, students were very accountable for their performance. They took total responsibility and um, it was definitely an empathy building exercise for me. So the third major theme, again, I'm just going to read a couple quotes. And um, as you'll remember, we had them look at the four different learning objects. So this is them commenting specifically on those. So I don't think I would ever think to be like, okay, I failed my midterm. Now I'm going to look for how to better do exams. I'd be more likely to be like, wow, I need to learn how to better understand the material. Someone else said, I would say, though, that understanding the concepts is more important than knowing these tips on multiple choice exams. Oops. Oops, spoiler alert. And lastly, <laughs> honestly, all of, these, all of this stuff is just dragging, around, dragging on around the central topic of study. What more can you do than read the entire textbook and do questions? Really, really important that when we're creating learning objects, we're connecting it to the course content. So even if it's using the same language that they use in the course, um, if it's not, if it's not, if the link is not direct to students, it's seen as sort of superfluous information uh, to the core content. So that came through loud and clear in the study. Okay, now I just wanted to run through a bunch of quotes that talk about the format and the tone. Um, these were. Uh, really popular sentiments from students. So a lot of these comments are a bit generic. Again, connected to the course content. We heard that loud and clear. It would be helpful, but if it were way shorter, a page, a list, it's a lot of text. I think that's another thing that got me with the handout. It wasn't bold enough to catch your eye. Another participant said, I don't like these videos. They are too cringy. They are cheesy. It's just like they bring you down and they are talking to you like a child, and I just don't like it. I'd probably never pick them up because I already have my own way of studying. The first time I saw these, I thought they were useful, but then I forgot about them. It's not unuseful, but a lot of people forget. And finally, okay, I would probably use the video just because it's more visual and I like to listen. The handout is more boring, and this is visually pleasing. It makes me want to engage, and it's only two minutes, so I can sit and listen. So to summarize all of that for you, First of all, I think I tried to drill that home. Peer learning is really important. So if there's any way that, as a library, you can encourage and bring together students, it will be really beneficial to their learning. Secondly, based on this information, we thought it would be really important to align marketing of e-learning objects with the academic calendar. So in one of the previous quotes, one of the students was talking about having their own way of learning, and we, we heard this over and over again, that yes, they do have their own way, and they will try that way until it fails. And then when it starts to falter, that's at the point where they're looking for support from us. So if there's a way that we can align it at that point of need, like after the midterm, when perhaps their own way of studying faltered, that would be really beneficial, if that makes sense. Okay, one minute. Um, also, integrating into the course management system, I didn't talk a lot about um, what we learned from students showing us around, but one of the major things we took away is that the course man that that's their home base. So we need to do a better job of being where they're at, rather than like in the co one of the quotes in the beginning, it talked about um, one of the students talked about forgetting about the object. So we need to do a better job of being where they're at, so they don't forget where the content is. So put it in the course management system because that's where they are. Also, video, video is preferred, that was overwhelming, but students are still using print and online versions of e-learning objects, so we wouldn't recommend getting rid of those formats. We actually heard a lot of students talking about how they like to take the handouts and really manipulate them and make notes and highlight them. So all of the formats are still in use, video is just preferred.
Now in terms of content, I'm gonna run through this really quickly. Oh, okay, <laughs> almost done. Uh, content, make sure it's really short. You heard that in one of the quotes. Also, it needs to be scannable. One of the students was talking about not, it not being bold enough, so make sure you're chunking the text and having bold headings so they can scan through it quickly. That's their preference. Also, the tone is important. You heard that quote before about being cringy. So it's being able to find the balance between an academic tone and a more down talk or, or plain language -y tone. So finding that middle ground, students were picking up on that. And finally, make sure that it's clearly linked to course material. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Julian. That was great. Um, so yeah, as I said, we'll have questions at the end of all the presentations. Um, so next up, we have Maria and Stephanie from the University of Toronto. Good morning, everyone. I'm Stephanie, this is Maria, and we're from the University of Toronto Libraries, and we're just two members of a larger team, and we're here to talk to you about our experience um, creating a toolkit that helps others get their open textbooks off the ground. Um, and since we have a captive audience here, we recognize that this is an opportunity for us to get feedback from our community of users as well, so Maria's gonna talk a little bit more about um, how you can provide feedback to us later. Okay, so how did this all start? Um, Canada's expertise and support of open educational resources has seen a open educational resources has seen a lot of growth in the last few years. Uh, provinces like Alberta and British Columbia have been leading the way in this area, and in Ontario, it has really been uh, an ad hoc experience up until about 2015. Um, and that's when we saw the government invest in the support and development of OERs, and this came in the form of eCampus Ontario, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with at this point. Um, and you, you will see them on the screen over here. So when funding was announced by eCampus in 2016, we knew we were gonna see a lot of uh, open textbooks, that, that pool of the number of them grow in Ontario. Um, and we thought that there might be a way to leverage the shared experience of all these new authors working in an open environment. Um, so they would be navigating new terrain, and there was an opportuni opportunity for us to learn from these experiences as well. So a little bit about our team. Um, we put together a proposal for a toolkit, and we were really lucky to receive some funding. Um, in terms of how we built the members of our team, we took a community-based approach. Um, so it's made up of individuals with expertise in functional areas including copyright and open licensing, preservation, IT, accessibility, and faculty support. So why did we choose a toolkit of all the things that we could create? Um, we realized uh, through, a, we, we did a, a comprehensive environmental scan as well before we uh, w went into this project, but there's a lot of guides on open educational resources that exist already. Um, we found that many of these guides were really tied to a particular platform. They tended to be written from a technical or a formatting perspective. Um, so we saw that there was an opportunity to develop a resource that offered guidance through the entire process and implementation. Uh, and these were the factors that were gonna be critical to the success of a project from start to finish. So seeing a gap in this area, uh, we thought the availabil uh, availability of a plain language, browsable startup kit would be invaluable to interested instructors and resource staff across the post-secondary institutions. So I'm gonna pass this over now to Maria, who's gonna talk a little bit more about the uh, process of the development of this toolkit. Hi everyone, and apologize to those who cannot quite see me, that's just my way of hiding from the camera. <laughs> I'll bring my box next time. All right, so I'll give you a sneak peek uh, at the toolkit just to um, illustrate what we mean by plain language. We decided to structure it in the question and answer format, and those questions and answers are grouped into the major sections that you can see here, and I'll let you simmer for four more minutes before I share the link to the actual live version, okay? And I want to talk a little bit about the uh, process of development. As Stephanie mentioned, um, 
a lot of our context for the toolkit was drawn from existing guides that we uh, did a comprehensive environmental scan of. But we also drew from a faculty needs survey that was conducted by Katya Pereslavska, our lead, um, as part of her uh, OCL appointment. And also from the existing open textbook projects that are ongoing currently, supported by the University of Toronto and funded by eCampus Ontario, we have a few of those in the works, and we are part of the group that helps get them off the ground so we know what questions exactly faculty ask. Um, so we put all those questions into a Google Doc, and we kind of divided the tasks based on our expertise. Stephanie uh, has expertise in copyright. I work in IT, so working on copyright and technology, and Katya was working on accessibility. And once the initial skeleton was ready, we shared it with librarians um, that were engaged in scholarly communications and open textbooks in their institutions. And if any of you here in this room were among those who provided feedback on that initial skeleton, thank you, it was very useful. And from there, we set to writing, and after the content was finished, we moved it into a website that is hosted by the University of Toronto. I'll show it to you in a sec. Um, and we are currently in the dissemination um, stage. That is why, as Stephanie mentioned, we're soliciting feedback. The toolkit is meant to be a living document, a work in progress, so comments are welcome. And before I move on there, I just wanted to uh, briefly outline the card certain exercise because people we shared it with found it pretty fascinating and I wanted to just highlight it a little bit. We got this idea from our user experience librarian who uses this tool to evaluate content when she builds web pages. So we took all of our headings for our questions, we had 44 headings, and put them in the tool that generated a link that we then sent to faculty that were engaged in our open textbook uh, creation, as well as other librarians that we knew in the community. And what it allows you to do, it allows you to drag and drop those headings into the categories that we predefined, but also to define your own categories. And on the back end, the toolkit gives us some analytics as to how many people, what the percentage of respondents agreed on where the categories, where the uh, headings fit into a certain category, and how many disagreed, and where we needed to adjust something. So as you can see, for example, our predefined funding category was not popular, so all the questions we thought would go there were put into other categories. And we received um, positive feedback. I'm pretty sure it was librarians who were fascinated by this tool. So uh, with all that information, we organized the website that uh, was soft launched in the fall of this year. This is the link. You're all welcome to go and take a look uh, and provide feedback on the tool either through this email or through the comment section on the actual website. And um, thank you so much. I believe we're even under time. Thank you, Maria and Stephanie. Uh, next up, we have Kelly from Ryerson University. Thank you, this is a perfect segue. Um, mine is also about OER. We have a team of OER librarians and a, a learning strategist at Ryerson. Um, who this fall used sprint methodology to figure out how to get faculty more interested in OER. So we w thought we would present today on using sprint methodology. We found it a great tool, not only for OER, but for possible e-learning projects or any real team-based project that um, your institution might have. Uh, so the team includes myself, Anne Ludbrook, Sally Wilson, and Michelle Schwartz. So um, we've been interested in OER for quite a while. We've done a lot of presentations to faculty, trying to get them on board, and you know, we, we figured we needed something new. Um, our institution was also awarded a grant from eCampus this summer uh, to create the repository that the open textbooks that um, Stephanie talked about um, will go in for all Ontario. Um, so we're quite invested in OER. And our head of e-learning um, suggested that we start to try design thinking in terms of getting professors on board with OER. Um, so in September, we hired a uh, design consultant to teach us about design methodology. Uh, we had people from the library, the e-learning office, um, our continuing ed program. 
And um, the problem we went in was how to, figure, how to figure out how to increase adoption of OER resources at Ryerson, but also to learn SPINT methodology so we could pass it on to the wider community. Um, and then at the end of the month, we passed it on to the wider OER librarian group by hosting a one-day SPINT methodology where we did it and we also learned how to do it. So what is spr uh, SPINT methodology? So it's a five-day process uh, and it answers your critical question uh, in business, it's your business question, through designing and prototyping and testing. Uh, it was developed by Google uh, and it uses various methodologies including design thinking which is a bit different for, for libraries. Uh, and it allows a team to shortcut months and months of work and get it done in a single week. It's very intensive but you get your idea out and working in a single week. And you role play it which is quite fun. Um, you create a, cut, a prototype and you actually do a lot of beforehand work where you, you line up customers and you line up experts to come in during the five days and test your product so you know you have a, a good working prototype. So design thinking, which was different to us, um, comes out of the Stanford School of Design. Uh, and our head of e-learning at Ryerson is in the communication area, so this was a great interest to her. But the first thing you do is you have to define the problem. So, and one thing we kept having to come back to, we would say, we need a libguide, and then we'd have to say, do we really need a libguide? You know, maybe we need something different. And you kind of realize that your problem's not your problem. When you go through what the second step is, you consider many options. So you start to like put lots of options on sticky notes and then group them together. And you honestly realize that that wasn't really your problem. Your problem is really this. It's a bit different. Um, and then you, you select, and this is where so there's too many wonderful ideas and you start to just combine them and you get this one great idea. So it's kind of like a democracy of, of ideas. Uh, and then you pick the winner, which is usually a combination of a couple of great ideas, and you execute with a prototype. So in design, you would maybe make a, uh, a, a very quick chair, and then you would bring people in to look at the chair and test the chair, and then you say, nope, I need an extra leg, or that doesn't work. So you're, you're constantly prototyping and uh, testing and seeing where to go. So a five-day sprint at Google would look like this. The first day, you would try to understand your problem. You would get all the research out there. You would bring in maybe experts who did a user, user experience study. The second day, you would start to uh, write down all the solutions. You start to diverge. You start to ideate. And that's where we used a lot of sticky notes. And it was quite fun to just get any ridiculous idea out there, it's any idea. Uh, day three, you would decide. Right? We storyboarded, each person storyboarded, it was quite fun, we had to draw. Um, and then you see physically what everyone's ideas look like and then you start to combine. I love that idea, let's bring that with that idea. Day four, you would create something, we literally drew it out on a whiteboard, we drew a web page out on a whiteboard. And day five, you would bring somebody in to like pretend to go through your fake website and then you really see where you've gone wrong or you've gone right and you get the customer feedback or the the professor feedback in our case. So we did this in two days, so it was quite condensed. We came up with our problem after brainstorming. We walked in thinking we were just gonna do a better workshop to faculty. We thought that was our problem, okay? But after doing all these ideas and storyboardings and drawing, we came out with a much, we thought was a much better idea. Uh, which was to have a better website that explained everything and then to have a drop-in session. Because we already had a drop-in session where professors came to ask questions about online content and then we would just have somebody there who also could tell them about OER. So our whole idea changed by doing this process. So we drew it out and we had professors come in. And the professors came in and they touched our fake uh, website and uh, they gave us wonderful feedback. First of all, they told us they would go straight to a person. That's how they work, okay? If they know the librarian who does OER, they just go straight to them. They're not gonna go to a website, right? So they liked the drop-in idea, but even that they would bypass because they would just phone up the OER librarian. Um, the words on the website, they were like, I don't know what this means. Or they would say, search, oh, I'm gonna find something. And what they thought they would find was completely different. So it was a wonderful exercise because we realized our language was wrong. So then we took this, because we knew what to do now, uh, and we did it for the OER librarians. It was a, anyone was, was invited in the college and university sector. And we did it over three types of areas. It was just a fun ex exercise. So one was to create a libguide. 
uh, one group was doing presentation resources that they could teach their faculty about OER. And the third one was to create a training manual for press books that everyone could use. And a one day looks like this. So you really have 30 minutes to uh, brainstorm. Uh, and then we had one peer from each group come around and look at your idea to see if it was good. And then you kind of had like an hour to create. Uh, and again, after you created something on a whiteboard, uh, people came around to look at your idea and give you feedback. And again, we got feedback on language. I, I would call it licensing as opposed to copyright. So it, even with this tiny little experiment, you still got good feedback. Um, so I wouldn't suggest the one day, it was, it was quite hectic. Um, but again, um, so that's our LibGuide. And again, we had people come and touch it and say what, like, where they would go and what they thought it was. But my takeaway was that it was a great team building, energizing concept. Like we really got into it. Uh, even if you don't like to draw, you know, it's a small group, you start to feel comfortable about drawing and showing your ideas. Um, you really start to think your problem and realize that's not your problem. That's quite exciting. Um, I think better ideas come out. Um, we, we tested our prototype and that was really valuable in realizing our language and maybe this wasn't even useful at all like with the website for professors. Um, and both times we felt we came away with a lot of knowledge and a working idea that was going to be easy to implement. We were excited about it and we had feedback within a day or two. So that's it. Um, I put some information down. I highly suggest for fun trying a design sprint methodology even for e-learning. It's possibly for if you want to do some new videos or anything like that. It's a, it's a fascinating fun way to, to create something in a few days and test it. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, next up, we have Melanie and uh, Michelle from the University of Ottawa. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Michelle Brown, and I'm the e-learning librarian at the University of Ottawa. Um, and this is my colleague, uh, Melanie Brunet, and she's our copyright services librarian. Um, so our presentation today is titled Migration Frustration, the Unexpected Surprises of Transitioning to a New LMS. This was originally submitted as a fail story. <laughs> so um, we're hoping this will serve as sort of a cautionary tale that you can all learn from today. Um, so this is the context of our situation. Um, the decision was made at the University of Ottawa to transition to a new LMS. And this started a long period of consultation. And we're happy to report that consultation happened with various stakeholders, everyone um, who were the major stakeholders on campus. So that included students, faculty, our access services unit, instructional designers, and the library. So the library was really involved in the consultation process from the start, so we were really happy about that. Um, we were able to give a great deal of input into the selection process, and we were involved in, um, we were invited to the demos for the finalists of the RFP process. Um, so the soft launch of the new LMS began in the spring of 2017. The migration of content took place during the spring and access to our previous LMS was cut off um, after June 1st, um, 2017. So it was sort of a long several months process of migrating all the content over. And um, the summer months were spent completing all the migration of the courses and we started um, training professors and TAs on how to use the new LMS. Hello. Um, so here's the problem. Uh, what happened is that we didn't see this coming. Uh, so proxy links from the, to the library resources actually don't work. So as soon as you add the proxy prefix into your link, it gets garbled and then you get to 404 not found. So that's a problem. Um, so what does that create as well? Well, frustration and, uh, among faculty and students because faculty are expecting to create a link that actually works, even and we showed them how to do it, add the proxy, make sure you add that, and then they add it, and then it doesn't work. Uh, and then students are clicking on links that don't work. 
But another problem that's, uh, that is coming from that is um, it discourages faculty to actually use links to our resources. Instead, they will download documents and then upload them to the LMS, which actually increases the risk of copyright infringement. Uh, and then also when you do that, it means with that there's no longer any links to, uh, for us to follow our, the, um, the usage of our e-resources. So that's another uh, downfall of this problem. So what was the solution? Um, we tried to take a multi-pronged approach to, to dealing with this problem. So the first was we developed a step-by-step -step, um, instruction guide to do some workarounds, so to change the links to make sure that they, were, they would work. Um, the step around or the step-by-step -step instructions were found on the Copyright Office website and on the library website. Um, the second approach that we took was training all of the library's frontline reference staff because we felt they would be the most likely um, people to receive questions from faculty when things started going wrong in the LMS. Um, and then the third thing that we did was we created some webinars and some presentations for faculty and TAs that were using the LMS quite a bit. So these were offered um, in conjunction with our teaching and learning unit. So this is just a screenshot of what um, the, the step-by-step workaround instructions looked like. So this was... Um, found front and center on the library's website. We have usually three or four um, rolling news items that, are, that change every two weeks. So we felt this was a nice catchy way to make people aware that there was a situation and this is where they could find help. So lessons learned. Um, these are not all number one, sorry. That's a formatting problem, but they're all important. Um, so, uh, <laughs> First thing that we've learned is that don't assume that something that worked in the previous LMS is going to work just as well in the new LMS. Uh, we had no clue this was going to happen. It even crossed our mind because proxy links were not a problem in the previous LMS. So something to keep in mind. Uh, the second one, which is actually really important, is that when there's a problem, uh, it should be reported to the vendor. Because what we've discovered is that while posting on listservs and asking other universities who use the same products, like oh yeah, do you know about this workaround? Like, yes, but it's a workaround. Like, it means the product actually doesn't work the way it's supposed to. And in the end, we discovered that the problem was never reported to the vendor. So now it is reported to the vendor and it's recognized as a system bug. Uh, I'm sad to report that we don't know when it's going to be fixed, but still, the vendor knows about it now, but f throughout all this time, nobody knew about it. Uh, or they knew, but they didn't share the information. So it's important to actually report it to the vendor. Um, and the next one is to be transparent about it. Uh, so we communicated the information as soon as we knew about it uh, to our different stakeholders. So that included you know, faculty, but also um, other librarians. So they would be prepared to ask questions or redirect questions. So there was a way to help uh, faculty, uh, but also uh, working with our um, teaching and learning uh, services, the, the people who are in charge of the LMS. Um, to uh, open communication, and so yeah, so we didn't, so we didn't wait for people to ask us questions because also the issue was that they could have asked the questions or for help in many different ways. Uh, sometimes it would go to the electronic resources librarian. Sometimes it would go to the reference people. Sometimes it would go to e-learning. So um, we tried to make it central and have a place where people could see what the workarounds are and take it from there. And the last two things that we learned are to be persistent. So we were in contact with everyone and anyone we thought could help us. <laughs> um, and we kept following up. We didn't, um, we didn't let it slide. We had to keep um, sort of getting on people <laughs> to see if um, anything had, had been solved. Um, we felt it was also very important to be diplomatic in your approach. So we didn't want to play the blame game. We didn't want to put the problem on other units um, on campus. We really wanted to work collaboratively with people to solve the problem to provide the best service for our users. 
So that's our presentation and um, thanks everyone. This is where you can reach us if you have any questions after today. Thank you, Michelle and Melanie. Um, next, we have Chris from Conestoga. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, my name is Chris. I'm from Conestoga. I uh, manage a variety of things at, at Conestoga, including uh, e-learning. Uh, I'm sorry about the title of my presentation here today. I think I probably watched a scary movie the night before I, uh, I was coming up with it, and I just ran with it, and then I, uh, anyway. Uh, the point is, I wanted to talk about a particular scenario that uh, we've uh, encountered at Conestoga, which is probably uh, common to a number of people here. Um, uh, what to do about the uh, courses that there's just an insane number of sections uh, to deal with. Um, so what we've ended up doing is embedding our services, but there's, there's absolutely no in-person uh, instruction in, in these classes anymore. And I wanted to sort of uh, review uh, what we've done in this in this course. Uh, so the current state uh, of the situation is that we're, we're working with um, the Common Communications course, which most colleges, I think, probably know about. At Conestoga, it's uh, about 4,000 students go through this class in the fall term and 5,000 total throughout the year. Um, when that sort of evolved into that situation, we realized our four instructional staff members could not visit these classrooms um, in, in two weeks. So we, we came up with some, some different ideas and the first thing we were able to do was integrate um, a number of video tutorials that we had been working on creating into the course, uh, becoming sort of an online module that is graded. It takes about 30 minutes for students to uh, take a look at the videos and then it includes a quiz that we, we worked on together with the faculty that were designing this course. It's worth 5%, so it's on equal weighting with the other labs in the class. But over time, also, we've been able to do some additional uh, things around academic support, including helping faculty learn about and choose to integrate an open text into this course, um, and also integrating weekly readings into the course from week one through to the end of the course that help students understand various different concepts related to uh, um, academic writing. Uh, so I'm going to talk about that just a little bit uh, more here. So firstly, the, the online tutorials and the graded quiz. Um, again, I said this is about 5,000 students that we connect with. Uh, Conestoga is about 13,000 students total. So this is pretty much every student that is starting at Conestoga uh, is enrolled in this course. Uh, so we've had some pretty good success with the online modules. At, at the, the very least, we can say that nearly every student that goes to Conestoga uh, is exposed to research skills development instruction. And because we've had access to the success statistics for the quiz, we know that uh, they're, they're understanding the content, uh, the, the current average for the, the quiz is 75, which was a big jump from 55%, which we weren't so happy about a few years ago. Uh, but we've worked on the, the, the wording of the quiz and the, the clarity, and, and it's really improved things for us. Uh, I don't have time to show you one of these modules, but I thought I'd put up this, this slide and uh, have you sort of think about what I could possibly have been trying to convey with this image. Um, it was paywalls, so you're, you're reaching for an article and then a, a large brick wall rises up with fire and, and e evil wizards stopping you from, from accessing the article. And this video is about what a, what a database is and uh, how it compares to searching Google and what you can find on Google versus through databases. Um, so it, you're welcome to you know, check out our, our collection of videos if you want um, later on. Are these going to be shared, the slides? Will, will they be shared with? Yeah, OK. So I've got links built into my presentation here. Uh, moving on, the textbook. So once we realized we couldn't um, manage to actually visit all these classrooms anymore, at a, at a certain point in time, we were going to uh, classes before they became consolidated into this super communications course of 160 sections. Um, we started coming up with other ways we can support faculty, and faculty were also reaching out to us to, to seek help. And one of those uh, ways that we're quite proud of is the fact that we've helped faculty integrate a an open text into their course. This is, uh, the text is called um, uh, Writing for Success. It's from the University of uh, Minnesota Libraries, published by them. 
and this occurred because we um, last last summer uh, the faculty curriculum team asked me to join them to uh, review the textbook situation in the course uh, and I sort of slid in the idea of open textbooks amongst some other uh, commercial textbooks that were being reviewed and honestly I don't think even though these these faculty members were very very savvy very um, passionate I don't think the open textbook thing had really made it to them once they learned about this and added it into the matrix of evaluating their texts they sort of fell in love with the, the idea and, and the content and so now we've got this nice statistic to be a part of um, just in, in about well yeah 1.3 academic years we've we've saved students $700,000 because they're no longer buying this textbook. They've got a, a nice open text to, to use within the course. And that's just a you know, number of students times cost of textbook. Oops. This is just, uh, this is our actual LMS uh, integrated, uh, the, the link to the, the textbook is integrated in there. It's also integrated into every week where they have to do readings. Uh, I basically put this up there because I also like to point out that our, our nice library, basically this is our entire library website is integrated into every um, every course at, at Conestoga. Uh, it's just sort of the mobile version of our website there. Um, and then weekly readings. So this has actually been going on for several years. Um, we offered the curriculum team our support and our time to actually comb through uh, library resources and find some quick, sort of brief, interesting uh, articles that could be used as weekly readings at, that uh, are examples of types of writing, like analytical writing, for instance, and then students have to actually do a paper that is analytical writing. And so I think since about 2014, we've had uh, a, a really great integration of um, resources from various library uh, subscriptions into this course. Uh, this course, uh, although we don't actually go to the classroom, which is sort of our bread and butter, well, that's what we're used to, I feel we've, we've got um, the most integration and involvement in this course than any other, which is also very nice because it's the largest course at Conestoga uh, in terms of number of students that are um, included. Why does that keep happening? Uh, so I haven't really been able to measure the impact of having these <coughs> articles integrated into the LMS, but um, they're still in there and they're still being used over the, co the course of time, so that's a success factor in and, itse in and of itself. Um, and just this whole process of, it was a lot of time to devote to, uh, to s comb through our collections and you know, many articles auditioned, few were selected by faculty, so even, even less uh, of that the work that we did actually came to fruition in the, cl in the course, but just the, the goodwill and the, um, um, the, the trust building that we developed with faculty and, and teaching faculty exactly what we're, uh, we're capable of in the library and what we're uh, willing to do to help them utilize the, the resources that are available to students was, uh, went a long way to uh, some of the, the future collaborations, which were the open texts and the online modules. Um, so I'm really proud of, of this as well. Uh, there it is, sort of embedded, too small type, but uh, we've got an article and then also three uh, of the chapters from the open textbook built into week four here for this course. I'm not going to go into really how we got here, but it took a long time. We've been doing this collaboration over about nine years, and the, the real hallmark moment was when the course, uh, all the communications courses that were delivered at Conestoga became amalgamated into one, and faculty wished to have something consistent in all of them, and that's when we realized we couldn't really visit the classroom any longer. Um, we did try for the first year, 80, 80 workshops, two weeks. It was difficult, but we did do it. Um, but then it doubled the year after, and we just couldn't do it any longer. So this is something I think has been successful for us. Uh, I don't know that it's unique in all its, in every aspect, but uh, what I'd like to say is, I mean, I'm here to share and also to give you ideas. So uh, if, for instance, you, you arrive at uh, our library website and, and like our online modules, any of those are freely, they're, they're open for you to use. I can send you files if you want to adapt them with your logos, that type of thing. Um, 
also, I'll, I'll plug the Learning Portal. It's a great resource uh, that our college friends will know about, but some of the, the rest of the folks here might not. This is a new uh, portal of resources, tutorials, etc., that um, are research and, and writing and, and various different t types of skills that, uh, okay, oh, this last slide. Um, that uh, you could also uh, utilize at your institutions. Uh, it's built by Ontario colleges for uh, online uh, courses. And then in terms of textbooks and readings, my, my main piece of info, and I think we've, we're starting to realize, is uh, w we need to <coughs> excuse me, promote to our, our faculty the things that we're doing and also be willing to do those things before we, we start doing that because there, there's a lot of work involved in uh, suddenly helping faculty assess textbooks, for instance, or combing through resources to find articles. But I think this is a really value-added uh, type of service for our faculty that they're actually interested in and that we can help. So uh, my suggestion is to have some very easy and simple web pages that talk about these services if you don't have them on your library websites already, and then, uh, again, plan to devote a lot of time to it if it becomes successful. Uh, okay. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Chris. Our final showcase presenter is Lindsay from the University of Guelph. Hi, um, I'm Lindsay. I'm a learning, and, um, sorry, I'm a library associate on the learning and curriculum support team at the University of Guelph. And Julian's presentation actually is a good kind of intro to what I'm going to be talking about. So she mentioned that we are kind of uh, trying to implement a digital strategy for um, when we're creating learning objects. Um, so instead of it being kind of an ad hoc approach where people kind of do whatever they want to do, we're trying to kind of make, a f make it focused and more consistent for the creation process. So we decided to create um, a staff training. Um, this training was developed with Melanie Perlet stewart Julian McLaughlin, um, Joanna Hatnick and Jason Dodd. So um, the training specifically focused on the process of creation um, from the point of the idea generation all the way to kind of a final draft stage. So everything basically that happens before the actual production of the object. Um, we decided we wanted to focus on active learning. Um, so get people to actually work through the process of creating an object. Um, as if they would actually be doing when they're creating content. Um, we also have a set of guiding principles that kind of worked as a frame for, um, for the, the training itself. Um, this allowed the, the uh, participants to get more familiar with the guiding principles um, so they could actually kind of understand um, what they meant and then how to apply them to the content creation. So what are the guiding principles? Um, so um, these were created a few years ago um, through kind of collaboration across the library in various discussions, looking at data um, and that kind of thing. So the first one is create easily consumable content, put learning before entertainment, use plain language and approachability, have rapid development and deployment, foster findability, create standalone and shareable assets, use diverse formats and styles, be collaborative in content creation, ensure barrier-free accessibility, and use consistent minimal branding. So not all of these um, guiding principles actually lent themselves to be used within the training, but we took the ones that we thought worked best and developed um, active learning strategies to get the participants involved. So the first thing that we did was look at create, um, create easily consumable content. So we asked them to brainstorm what does this really mean. So we were looking for things like focus on one um, learning outcome per object. Um, they should be short, so no more than two to three minutes. Break them down into manageable chunks, so not trying to cover too much content in that time. If it was kind of a larger thing, we could scaffold that content across various objects. Um, it would be easy to understand and follow and be approachable. Um, with this in mind, um, we gave them a fast fact, which is a very large handout, usually around 10 pages long, um, that they could then go through and try to find three easily consumable um, topics. Um, and then we would discuss that as a group. So we got them to work in, with a partner who was not from their team in the library, trying to get them to think more broadly about the library and how we assist our users in a more broader context. 
so then we would discuss their topics as a group and we found that even with kind of the understanding of what easily consumable content might be, things were still fairly broad and they still needed to be brought down even further. So for example, how to organize group meetings might actually turn into five tools to help you keep your group organized and on task. So the next one we looked at was, pur we added a purposeful learning before entertainment because um, as Julian pointed out too, things that are general, students don't really understand how to apply them or understand their usefulness. So they had to be directly linked to an assignment. So we get people to kind of um, um, choose one of their easily consumable topics and get them to assess it and actually think about when would this object actually be used? In what context? So in what assignment or task would this object be used for? What skill are we trying to help them develop? From there, we would get them to um, write a learning outcome, which some people were not as familiar with, so basically we rena renamed it as a purpose statement um, to help them to kind of focus. Um, also use plain language and approachability. So this was basically kind of us trying to get people to be more aware of the jargon that they use in everyday um, work and try to get people to use language um, and terms that students themselves use. So we look at this example of social media do's and don'ts and we took a portion of it and got them to kind of look at it um, and kind of um, point out areas to change. So the script is filled with pop cultural references and language not really expected from a library video. So it's going back to that um, authority that we also need to have with also being approachable. So it allowed us to have discussions about how language can be confusion, confusing and exclusionary. Um, so next one was rapid development and deployment. So this activity, um, Crazy Eights, um, is borrowed from the design sprint world. Um, what you do is you take a piece of paper and fold it into eight rectangles. Um, then you have to imagine um, your object in eight different ways. So this is kind of focusing on format and um, not and layout rather than word choice and how you want to say things. Um, so it's specifically looking at what your what form your object is going to take. Um, then we kind of discuss it afterwards. And participants found that those first few boxes were filled with kind of the standard thing that you would expect from library learning objects. But as they progressed, they were forced to think of things kind of outside of what they would normally do. And that's when the creativity um, started flowing. Um, so it's really um, a great challenge for these people to realize that you can kind of push yourself even with only 45 seconds to think differently than you might normally do. So we also wanted to make sure that people were collaborative in their content creation. So all of our activities require that they work with other people um, and to think, to listen to each other as well in order to figure out um, what other people might have to say and other perspectives. Um, outside of the guiding principles, we also thought it was important to talk about providing and receiving feedback um, because we want to make sure that as objects are created at the library that we are going through a regular feedback process. Um, so we do go over kind of things to look for as you're going over the object. Um, so specific questions to ask about um, the format, the purpose, um, the content itself, whether there's, there's too much, that kind of thing. And then they're given an object to actually provide feedback on. Um, we talk about using I statements, so kind of approaching it as an audience member, talking about how you are experiencing the object, uh, the object itself, um, what kind of questions that you might have or things that you are unclear. We discuss afterwards and um, we try to kind of ask prompting questions, get people to think about things that they might have missed um, and that kind of thing. And we also talk about the process of providing feedback as well. So what did we learn? Um, that unexpected people participated. So we've actually run this session four times since June, I think. Um, and we've had 24 people from across the library participate and all from a variety of different teams, um, which has been really exciting to see the different people come out. Um, feedback is hard to get and hard to receive and hard to give. <laughs> so in all aspects of this training, we have found um, that um, in terms of getting people to give feedbacks on, feedback on the object, people are kind of afraid to be critical. Um, they're afraid of hurting people's feelings, which is nice, but it ultimately um, defeats the purpose of the feedback cycles. So trying to get people to be a little bit more rigorous um, in terms of the kind of questions that they're asking 
It's also hard with the receiving end because we do have find that some people get very defensive um, and they take it very personally. So while we do talk about how to receive feedback in the training session, we realize we need to work in it a little bit more um, as well. So for future directions, we want to make it more blended. Um, we do have a very large unwieldy guide, um, so it doesn't have a lot of help content on there. So we want to make sure that we are providing more objects to help people create these, this content along the way, things about um, writing scripts or creating storyboards. We also want to think about providing refreshers. Because somebody, um, either we might change something, even the guiding principles or the process and how we create objects, and we might even need to update people on what the changes are. Or there might be a really long time between when somebody takes the training and then actually creates an object. So building in those opportunities um, to uh, redevelop those skills. But overall, we've had a really good experience. <laughs> I think I am done. Thank you, Lindsay. OK, at this point, um, we have a little bit of time left. So I'd like to invite the showcase speakers to come back up if you can make it through the crowd. Um, and if the crowd has any questions, we have about 10 minutes for questions. So just raise your hand. It was just me. <laughs> just me. <laughs> I have a question um, <laughs> for the brunch director. Um, how did you decide when you, like, how many people were in the room at that time and who was in the room to do this? Um, so for the, for the presentation, we wanted a few people. Uh, I think generally, So the question was, um, what, what types of faculty members were involved in the creating of the modules? Um, so uh, the library pretty much created the videos independently. They, they were uh, broadly for other areas as well. They're not so specific, which is maybe something we should investigate, um, as to only apply to the, the comm course. Um, but the, the quiz that was developed for the videos was developed by one particular faculty member who is a part of the curriculum development team for that course. Um, and so I guess the team would have reviewed his work and, and uh, we all sort of looked at it together, but he came up with the, uh, the quiz itself. And then uh, after it didn't do so well the first year and there was a 55% sort of success rate for, for answering the questions. Uh, our library team took a look at the, the questions themselves and uh, made some revisions. And also the, the key thing that we did was uh, embed the videos into the questions. Uh, so the students view the video within the quiz and have the quiz question uh, below. And that really spiked our view rate um, and the, uh, the
so we only had two professors come in, um, a new professor and an experienced professor, and um, they each had about 15 minutes to, uh, to, to go through. Do you have Um, that was more a general comment on all of, it wasn't the specific video we looked at, they, um, so yeah, I don't know, when, now, when Lindsay, yeah, okay, I'll, yeah, I'll just want to, okay, go, go, <laughs> <I> <laughs> the think, guest speaker. One of the big things that we've noticed was using even cartoon characters was really offensive, so you know when Pouch gave those talking faces, they found those very, we've had other feedback outside of that study that's like super annoying. They don't, so they don't want to see things like that. Um, sometimes we thought things were cute, like little animals. Wasn't going over so well. Um, and I think it's really about when you think maybe we're being like helpful and kind of jokey, it's not cool. Um, <laughs> watching ourselves with things like that. Yeah, and it's really like I tried to work, um, get across that it's finding the middle ground between too jargony, too academic tone, and then sort of the perceived talking down to them. So we're still working through it, I think. And it's it's pretty, um, it depends on what, what the object is that we're creating, too. So yeah, they, they pick up on the tone. That was something I was really surprised at as well. So, yeah. Um, how many people just put you in the focus group? Was there one focus group or multiple? How did the... So how many people participated in the focus group? So they were small. This is the first time we've done sort of small group interviews. So we had students sign up with people that they actually knew, which I think really changed the dynamic, because sometimes we have one-on-ones, which um, can be uncomfortable. Uh, so anyway, we had a total of 18 participants, and that was nine uh, small group interviews. So sometimes there were uh, mostly two people in each session. How did we integrate our videos and uh, tutorials and quizzes into the LMS? Uh, like, how did we gain access to it, or how did? I mean, um, like, did you create a library module and then the instructors can kind of like grasp on your? Oh, uh, actually, for uh, they, the instructional team gave me access to their course shell which then populates to all the, uh, the sections of the course. Um, so I actually went into the, as a, a designer within the course, and I did, all, I, I, I did all the embedding work of the videos into the, the, the quizzes and uh, uh, created sections uh, within the site as well that embed the videos directly rather than linking out to the, to the content on our library website. And that can't, that probably doesn't, you know, that's a, that's a trust relationship that I have with, with those folks and, and that may not be something that everybody is able to do, but we were fortunate to be able to do that. So, um, did you have to do, do it like course by course or you just do No, so, so the shell is sort of the, the um, template. So we put it in the template and then magic happens and that fires out to all of the, uh, the courses, the, the individual sections, the 160. So I only had to do it once, and then it rolls out to everywhere else. Uh, this one is it. So the open textbook, so the course is just a sort of a reading and writing at an academic level style course. So the textbook is called Writing for Success. It's 
very much a first year communications writing text, so it covers that type of information, uh, write, writing uh, certain types of essays and writing down grammar and punctuation. Uh, it's, uh, again, it's published by the University of Minnesota Libraries. They have a, a, a pretty good online, or sorry, an open textbook collection there that they've been uh, producing and adapting from other sources. So this one, in fact, is adapted from yet somewhere else, I believe. Um, so, uh, yeah, and, and the, it's quite an extensive text. The course doesn't use the whole text. They looked at which chapters of the text would be useful for which weeks and just linked to those specific chapters or parts of chapters. Um, the, you can't yet track if students are looking at the chapters, but, <laughs> um, well, actually, they might be, uh, I'm not sure what the, the report at least clicks into the links, probably you can. Uh, although we're looking at also integrating this open text into uh, what's called the Textidium platform, which uh, some of you may, may know about Conestoga. You've recently started using it as a, a textbook platform for the required texts at the college, not across the board, but uh, in a number of courses. And uh, ECAM in Ontario and Textidium sort of been talking together and, and there's the ability to integrate uh, open text into that platform as well, at which point students would be able to um, use a lot of the features of, of the you know, markup of the textbook and highlighting, etc. And you would be more able to track whether or not students are actually utilizing the text, I believe, in that method as well. So I think in the interest of time, we're going to have to cut the question period short here, but uh, we're moving into a break, so I'm sure you can ask any of our presenters during the break. Uh, one more round of applause for everybody.